Intramuros was the biggest European city in Asia. It defines our culture. The problem is most of our officials do not appreciate it. because it's part of our history, part of our heritage, and one of the few physical evidences uh, remaining of uh, the uh, Spanish period of Philippine history. There are many good stories about Filipinos, people who headed the construction of the walls. The carvers were Filipinos also. It was a very exciting time, that's what I remember most, having a restoration force as big as Intramuros was at the time, well, didn't exist anywhere in the country. When we came into Intramuros to work, uh, what are we restoring? We do not know how did it look, except for the ruined walls. That's why we have to, to dig pictures and pictures and pictures just to be able to, to provide a background. And in the early days, it was really a dead town. Even when Casa Manila was finished, we would make whatever pakulo just to bring in people. Uh, the greatest satisfaction I had was uh, the presence of a good team uh, because uh, basically the three of us uh, were the ones who set the initial uh, directions of uh, the Intramuros administration. Since last year, I'm really amazed at how Intramuros has grown and has attracted so many people considering the problems we had in the beginning. There are thousands of people coming here and all of them are paying. Entrance fees, restaurants, everything. all those calais. Can you imagine? It's alive. You have many people saying that Intramuros should not be preserved because it is a colonial memory and that should be erased. I don't think so. So it's about time that our people should see Intramuros is not just a symbol of colonialization, but a symbol of our spirit to rise above that. Intramuros for me is a place that tells you the story of Manila, the city that I was born in, the city that I worked in, and the city that I live in and will probably live in for the next um, years. My life with Intramuros began in 1999 when I started volunteering for a museum, uh, Bahay Chinoy. And it was from there that I started uh, doing cultural work, and eventually which led to us establishing our tour outfit in 2005. Intramuros is a place of a lot of personal memories for me, because I've been coming here since I was a little boy. I remember my first trip here was in the 1980s when we had a school trip at San Agustin Museum. And I distinctly remember getting freaked out because I went to a crypt with lots of dead people and uh, which nobody really explained what they were. So that fascination with Manila's history, with my personal family's history, began here in Intramuros. I think what we do here in Intramuros introduces people to our city. And by introducing Intramuros to our visitors, we tell them the story and we make them understand the city, my city, Manila, why, what it was, how it is today, and what it will be in the future. My hopes for Intramuros is to be 
a place that is anchored in its past, but at the same time, it's a place that can have new ideas for the future. No? A place that will inspire people, a place that will create good memories, and a place that will make you feel good about being a Manilenio. I'm Ivan Mandi. I'm a cultural guide from Old Manila Walks, and we have been doing historical walks around the old city since 2005. I see myself as a cultural worker and a storyteller, uh, and I tell basically the, the story of our city, and the story of Manila uh, begins here in Intramuro. Every great and important city has an old town. Intramuros to me is Manila's old town. I have always been awed by Intramuros. It seems like when I'm coming here, there is an excitement that you feel that what happened in this place. There is something so sacred, so noble, so precious about Intramuros. Uh, I named it after uh, my grandmother, Barbara, uh, to just give it a Spanish flavor. And uh, for some years, for uh, after a few years, we decided to really gear towards heritage so that people will see and know what is heritage, what is sinauna, yung kinaugalian natin, yung traditions natin, which will be seen in our cuisine and in our uh, performances, in the dance that we present here in Barbaros. I would attribute it to my mom, to my mother, who taught me the value of work, the value of uh, excellence, uh, the value of uh, feeding people in, in, a, in style and 
giving them satisfaction. I would want to happen that Intramuros will be remembered by every person who comes to this place because of its uh, uniqueness, its sacredness, its history, its everything. There is so much here. I'm Barbara Gordon de los Reyes of Barbara's Heritage Restaurant. I have been in Intramuros for the past 30 years, which has been uh, a great part of my work, my joys. It's like an adventure. I'm uh, Martin Tino Jr. My Lolo became chairman of the Comelec, and he was the one who transferred the Comelec to Intramuros. I was in grade school. He would go home at 6 o'clock every afternoon. They pick us up at 4 o'clock, so I have to wait for him in his office. So I would go around Intramuros in the 19, early 50s. It was all ruins. I've always been interested in old houses. I began traveling throughout the whole country. Intramuros was the biggest European city in Asia. This is our history. It defines our culture. The problem is most of our officials do not appreciate it. IA was founded, and uh, Jimmy Laya, I didn't know Jimmy Laya, he got me as a consultant. Then we started having exhibits, uh, the first ever, on Relieves, on Santos, on Ivory. We have all these horrible looking modern buildings. I wish they could tear it down and rebuild it properly. And in the early days, it was really a dead town. Even when Casa Manila was finished, we would make whatever pakulo just to bring in people. In the afternoon, Intramuros was empty. Empty. There was hardly any people. Since last year, I'm really amazed at how Intramuros has grown and has attracted so many people, considering the problems we had in the beginning. There are thousands of people coming here, and all of them are paying. The entrance fees, restaurants, everything, all those calais. Can you imagine? It's alive. You can see the whole thing is alive. As I always uh, say before, no, whenever we say uh, Manila, Manila was of course in Tiramuros. And uh, during the Spanish period, and it's, it was their prime uh, city. No? And so everything that was um, about Philippine history and culture during the Spanish and of course the American period uh, began and eventually developed you know, in the old city. And in the course of time, no, this uh, would become also a uh, prime 
urban tourism area, especially with their restoration and their heritage conservation that has been going on in the uh, city. I think the biggest challenge for Intramuros is for it to be incorporated into that modernization without affecting the uh, historical heritage of the uh, walled city. I mean, accommodations can be done for the uh, modernization that is happening. Uh, internet, telephones, you know, modern facilities for tourists. But it doesn't have to come at the sacrifice of what existed there before. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges until today you know, uh, for um, developing intramuros. I'm uh, Dr. Jose Victor Torres. I'm a, uh, I'm a uh, associate uh, professor here at the uh, History Department of the uh, De La Salle University. I teach uh, Rizal and uh, Philin Philippine history here in the uh, history uh, department. Well, I think it's because it's one of the closest place. If you're if you're a foreign visitor, it's one of the closest uh, place and one of the most uh, visited based on tourism information. It's one of the uh, most visited uh, places in uh, in the Manila. Because you have to remember, Manila is the capital city. And uh, a capital city has to have its attraction, both old and new. And for so many years, that old attraction, and I don't mean old because it's passe, no? it's old because uh, it's part of our past. And the realization that there was something that remained behind for the people to know and experience and see with their uh, own eyes is probably something that's uh, that's um, an experience, a good experience for visitors, both foreign and uh, local. I'd probably sure describe it Ramuros as uh, rich. It's rich in heritage. It's rich in the Filipino identity and it's very rich in our history and culture. And I think that uh, would fit the description not only before but today. And as I always said, whenever you walk through the streets of Intramuros, you are walking through Philippine uh, history. Intramuros is valuable not only for me but for you.
So welcome everybody to the 34th episode of the Intramuros Learning Sessions. Uh, this is your host, Ran Chorcilia, and this episode was brought to you by the Intramuros Administration. We are pleased to have a topic today on cacao with speakers from across the continent. But before that, let me read first some house rules. Okay, so for Zoom attendees, you may raise your questions via the Q&A. And for Facebook viewers, you may raise your questions in the comment section. Uh, please note that only those who have successfully registered and viewed on Zoom will be eligible to get a certificate and the feedback form will be emailed to you after the session. The certificate will then be sent within a week. Note that, uh, note that this webinar is recorded and that the recording shall be made permanently available in IA's social media channels. Now to present our speakers. So we have both uh, local and international speakers. So first off, we have uh, Patrick Belisario, who is a registered agricultural engineer since 1995. He has a BS in Agricultural Engineering from Xavier University and a Master's in Development Management from the Asian Institute of Management. He has extensive experience in NGO developing and implementing rural agri-enterprises financing sustainable ag and, and financing sustainable agri-enterprises. Among others, he also organized the Organic Certification Center of the Philippines as well as the Virgin Coconut Oil Philippines. He has 15 years of experience as an independent consultant, researcher, writer, and international organic and fair trade inspector, as well as organic grower. Uh, he has an organic grower certification, and uh, he is a geographical indication technical expert. Next, we have uh, Mr. Ernesto Pantua. He is the owner and general manager of Cablon Farms. Ernesto's farm is a family-owned farm and is located in Tupi, South Cotabato. The farm combines sustainable methods of farming and fair trade. Then we have Matthew Dyring. Mr. Dyring wears many hats. He is a consultant, teacher, and chocolatier, as well as a, chef, a pastry chef and dessert lover. He was born in Belgium, but is now based in Germany, where he has worked with famous chefs and establishment, establishments like... Uh, Waterside Inn uh, for G Gordon Ramsay as pastry chef, Sans Cravet, La Maison Auberweiss, Berry, Berry Colibot Chocolate Academy, and, uh, and, Bor and Berry Colibot Chocolate, Chocolate Academy. He now has a Binto Bar brand, uh, Artist Chocolate, uh, which uh, received from International Chocolate Awards, a silver prize for two Cablon Farm Origin Bars. Then we have Isabel Cars. at Instagram in order to educate the public about his trips to chocolate festivals all over Europe and visit to makers, traders, and all kinds of chocolate experts. His chocolate tasting average for the past four years is about five different bars per week. Then finally, we have our guest moderator for today, uh, whom I will turn over the screen later. So we have Stella Duque. Estella is an architect, historian, and social entrepreneur, as well as certified chocolate taster and chocolate competition judge in Europe. In 2015, she founded Molinet Chocolat Limited in order to introduce Philippine cacao to the world. She started in 2017 the only craft chocolate event of the Philippines, now called Intramural Chocolate Festival. Geographic indications for cacao in the Philippines is one of the channels of her advocacy in heritage conservation. So those are our speakers for today. 
Now, I'd like to turn over the screen to our guest moderator, Mrs. Stella. Stella? Hi. Um, good morning to everyone. Um, and good evening to everybody in the Philippines. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody today. This is a very big event for us because it's a culmination of months of work for geographical indications. And um, I'd like to start with a presentation to introduce the topic. Let's see if I can get it to start. Okay. And let's see. Okay. So let's start with this. And um, this is a series of um, presentations, which is now on the third topic. Um, let's see if I can move forward with it. We started in July um, 2020 with um, textiles, Philippine textiles. And um, then in August, the following month, we moved on to agricultural goods. And now we are focusing on a very specific um, product, which is uh, specialty cacao. I'd like to just um, provide credits for everybody who's involved right now. And the first 30 minutes, we will spend discussing specialty cacao and uh, geographic indications as it applies to this commodity. And the last 30 minutes, we will look at how the um, commodity is used in the manufacturing side, in particular, that part of the world which supports geographical indications. Um, and we have three guests who will be involved in that. Um, this is a... Uh, an overview of what will happen today. We have uh, a presentation by Cablon Farms about the history of the farm. Patrick will talk about geographic indications and we have our three guests from the manufacturing world talking about chocolate and um, specifically single origin and craft production. Um, and this is an overview of what I will do today. And uh, let's move on to the specifics. Uh, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what GI actually is. And in Europe, uh, it is a more varied uh, type of, of um, quality standards uh, system. Um, and in the Philippines, uh, it comes to us through the European Union uh, funding. I just want to show here uh, what kind of um, pressures are on the Philippines in terms of uh, making the system work and actually enabling it to happen because we don't have anything yet in the Philippines. And so on one side, we have the European, European Union, which supports the project. And on the other side, we have the um, United States, which does not follow it. And unfortunately, at this point in time, we are only following the U.S. system. And so this whole project is all about encouraging us to move forward as the rest of the region has already. Um, I just wanted to uh, show that we have to approach this particular topic, not just as a practice, but also in terms of a discourse that is built around um, this whole uh, trade and this whole topic um, and in this sense we have a lot of things that uh, are studied that are already in print about this uh, we're not going to go that into detail because in the other uh, earlier webinars we already did a little bit of that and you can go back into the internet and watch these discussions um, just to show you quickly the overview of the uh, discourse uh, we are looking at this kinds of practices. And to show you the kind of complexity uh, that is involved in this, I just wanted to show you this uh, illustration of what happens at the country of origin and what happens outside when a supranational body gets involved. Uh, 
Uh, Patrick will say a little bit, per perhaps a little bit on that later on. Right, and this is our situation in the Philippines. Um, so we have um, Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar all having at least one um, GI system, um, product. And here we have the Philippines with nothing. What we have is a collective mark. And the collective mark is not quite the same because it is more like a privately owned trademark. It cannot be protected um, at the World Trade Organization level and it is not a national uh, level kind of um, system. So, uh, and I wanted to point out that this is not a unique um, system that we're trying to do. There are actually countries with their own GI for cacao. In particular, particular Mexico is a very important one because historically and genetically, our cacao in the Philippines comes originally from Mexico and Venezuela. And I just wanted to point out that um, in 2016, they already have one for uh, their cacao. And so it joins all these other products, uh, indigenous spirits, um, pottery, wooden uh, handicraft, coffee, um, minerals, and uh, alcohol, uh, mango, vanilla, and chili, and also rice. So that's Mexico for you. Right, and what I want to point out and what we will understand here is how are the terms single origin and single estate used for this um, sector. And this is already a very common term uh, in other um, food industries. So we have uh, whiskey and malt. Uh, we have uh, coffee, we have wine. Um, and we have single estate. And so we also have another term, micro batch or micro lots which is already being used extensively out there. And so um, I just wanted to point out here that we have the supranational bodies, we have the national, regional, and cooperative levels, and then we have the farm level. And at this point, this is where uh, IG, GI becomes uh, a really big effort, not just for the farm or the region, but it has to involve um, the government. And with that, I move on to the next presentation with uh, Kablon Farms. Tito June. Ah, let me start a new one. Okay. Okay, screen share. Okay, do I start? Yes. Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm uh, June Pantua, although my real name is Ernesto, my nickname is June, and uh, I am the co-owner of a family farm that was started by my, uh, my father. So, uh, next slide, please. Okay, I'll be talking about the history of the farm and uh, so next would be cacao flavor development and uh, I would also be telling you about how we started uh, developing our cacao and uh, on letter C the next step would be the fermentation development and uh, at the the intellectual property farm investment portion. Uh, my niece, Estella, would uh, help me explain that. Okay, so uh, this is our farm. Next slide, please. Estella? Yes. It already the picture, the picture? Yep. Okay, this is our farm. 
As you can see, it's at the foot of a volcano. That volcano is Mount Matutu in Tupi, South Cotabato. It's about 500 meters above sea, the, the, land, the land. The farm is about 500 meters above sea level. And you can see uh, the farm after the large pineapple plantation. So uh, to describe it uh, literally, it's an, it's an island in the middle of a sea of pineapple. It's a complete contrast farm from a monoculture pineapple to a biodiversified biodiversify orga organic farming, multi-crop farming. Next slide, please. So this was established early 1960s uh, with my father um, purchasing the first 12 hectare land. So, um, and uh, his vision of the farm was actually a multi-crop farm during his uh, early establishment of the farm. He planted uh, uh, co coconut, coffee, cacao, abaca, and bananas. And uh, yeah, uh, but he is a weekend farmer. He's not really a full-time farmer because he's a businessman also. So by early 70s, um, we have started, uh, that is, this is about mid 70s to early 80s. Uh, at this time, this period of our farming, uh, there's been a major setback because of globalization. As you well all know, at this period, the commodity prices of coconuts were affected. The cacao um, prices were affected because of the introduction of the hybrid cacao from Malaysia. So, uh, and significantly, uh, the taste of, uh, while the production of cacao was shooting up, the demand was getting low. Why? Because the farmer were really uh, uh, attracted to uh, the hybrid cacao because of their productivity and resistance to pests and diseases. So what the farmers did was unfortunately to cut all those um, native cacao trees, crops that that were, as we know now, were legacy from our from the orga from from the Spanish era. So fortunately, my father came from Laguna, a province south of Metro Manila in the Luzon, Luzon Island. Uh, in their community, when he was young, they were really taught how to drink chocolate in the morning. So. He, he was very familiar with the taste of um, uh, the Criollo cacao made as a tableia. So when that period, um, when, when during that period, we had really a very hard time because also in that period, while the commodity prices was getting down, um, the the labor force also were uh, demanding for, for uh, minimum wage. So uh, during those times, my, me particularly after my graduation in college, um, I told my father that, oh, we don't, uh, we cannot afford anymore to buy fertilizer to do the spraying of uh, synthetic uh, pesticides. So um, during also those times, organic materials from from uh, large uh, poultry, from uh, rice meals were almost free. Nobody's using it. So what we did was to eliminate uh, all those uh, commercial fertilizers and pesticides. And 
began practicing organic farming. So not only that were the changes, but also um, for the market, for the marketing of our products. Since uh, the prices of the um, commodity crops were going down, we decided to open a small fruit stand store at the National Highway because our farm is about a kilometer away from the National Highway. And from there, we realized that uh, to survive, we have to process our own produce. So that, that was the start of, uh, of uh, processing our fruit products, harvested fruit products. So next slide, slide, slide please. And yes, as you can see, uh, this is a new uh, drying method that we have introduced uh, because of what Marsh Chocolate of U.S. shared to the cacao growers of Dabao. And uh, this, uh, yeah, okay. And the, 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 that, that dryer that was previously shown really uh, improved uh, the quality of our cacao beans because uh, before that system, we only dry our cacao beans in the concrete um, dryers, sand drying. So tab our tablea production started at 1970s when I was still very small and uh, of course gradually uh, we, we we have introduced the tableas in the supermarkets of this region. By mid-1980s we, we established actually our fermentation, the, our regular fermentation protocol because one of the Philippine uh, companies in Davao, the Philippine Coca Corporation, they were the first one to give really a, a higher price for fermented cacao beans. So, uh, next slide, please. Because of the fermentation protocols and because of the, the contribution of my niece in opening up the European market, um, we tried to get or hire a fermentation scientist, which Stella introduced to us, to develop new flavors from our, from our beans. Our beans really is uh, unique in the region because uh, I think we were the only one that planted our cacao from, from seeds from our own farm. Because my father did not cut his criollo beans, a criollo trees, and we also planted the hybrid ones during the mid 1980s. And when we expanded our crop, we use the seeds from the farm. And uh, of course, uh, from there, we also develop our own uh, fermentation protocol. And uh, fortunately, as I have said, Stella uh, developed or opened to us the market in Europe. And from there, uh, have hired a fermentation scientists and uh, develop protocol for three, uh, yeah, three diff different flavors. Next slide, please. And these are the Bon Bulac and Bon Bulac, which is more on the floral notes and uh, Malana Bolong for the spicy and herb um, flavor notes and for the fruity ones are the 
prepare few more few more these these uh, names are derived from the languages of the blaans which are workers about uh, 70% of them are the natives that are living uh, near our farm which we also employ and uh, we just recently have renewed our Ceres organic certification for the second time. The, yeah. And now, recently, during this pandemic uh, period, we exported uh, a van to Uncommon. And hopefully, this development of cacao would uh, not only benefit our farm but also the region because uh, of a very good uh, environmental conditions and uh, soil for cacao. Actually there are a lot of uh, farmers already uh, planted cacao but uh, they really don't uh, they don't have the knowledge for proper fermentation and uh, post-harvest uh, protocols for uh, cacao. So, yeah, for the intellectual property, this uh, this segment, my my niece Stella will further explain. John, can you unmute me? You are already unmuted. Okay. Uh, so um, I just wanted to point out here that when we move towards the future, this really is something that um, we want to do in order for the farm to be able to share the kind of bounty that we are experiencing um, with the protocols that we have created. And the kind of impact that we want to make is uh, three in three ways. In particular, we want to look at environmental sustainability, which has been the farm's um, goal from the very beginning, as my uncle had pointed out. Uh, they have been looking at organic farming for a very long time, and we want to bring in as many people into the fold uh, as possible from the region. Um, we are also looking at sharing economic prosperity, and in particular, not just for the workers who are actually living in the um, Tupi or the neighboring areas, but everybody who can actually participate um, within the region. Uh, and how do we do this? By stabilizing the price of cacao. And with that, we build a new community. Uh, the people who share the same values and the same kind of goals as uh, the farm itself. Um, now, there is a relationship between cacao quality and the price, and that has impact not only on the export market, but also the domestic market. Once um, chocolate makers or uh, buyers understand that what we are providing, the international market, is also what they're going to get, they are happier to pay for a premium. Now, that premium hasn't translated quite for organic cacao yet, but in terms of um, the general trade of cacao, people are happier to have the same kind of quality given to them. Um, and so this is why I think actually geographic indications is a very important step, uh, not just for Cablon farms, but for the region and for the Philippines. Um, just to point out, I wanted to show you the kind of market we have now in Europe and what is going to happen in the future, uh, despite the pandemic. And now um, I would like to introduce the next speaker who will be able to tell us more about uh, geographic indications. And I want to end with this slide um, by pointing out that... Um, we are actually looking at the kind of language and that the kind of um, ideas that come from um, 
other sectors in particular from wine and coffee and the idea of terroir in particular is something that we need to develop. And there are two sides to this. On one hand, you have nature. And then on the other hand, you have nurture coming from um, the human contributions. And with this, I would like to end by uh, turning over to Patrick. Good, good evening here in Philippines and uh, good afternoon in, in Europe. Um, I'll be sharing with you my presentation on the geographical indications. Um, basically, uh, I would like to take off my, my presentation uh, from the last slide uh, provided by, by Stella. Uh, first is uh, yeah um, the the title of my presentation is uh, offering offering a way to move forward to transition towards this uh, goal to have a South Cotabato cacao as product of geographical geographical indication. Okay, so this is the, the title of the topic. Um, to, understand, to understand the geographical indication is to simply look at the best model, the gold standard in GI, which is the champagne. Um, before, uh, champagne products uh, can, are, are coming from different parts of the world, but with the with the concept of geographical indication, only the producers, only the producers in the Champagne region, are allowed to label their product as uh, Champagne. And of course, uh, those uh, producers uh, follow the certain concept of uh, terroir. Uh, the French word, uh, which incorporates the tangible characteristics of the growing environment and the intangible cultural aspects that shape the product. Um, so basically, uh, the, the concept of terroir, you have the, it, it is a concept, a combination of uh, nurture and nature, or basically nature and nurture. Um, when we say uh, the, the natural side or the tangible sides are, of course, the, the agroclimatic conditions, uh, you have uh, to consider the soil, the climate, topography, and biodiversity. Um, in agriculture, that's very important. Um, that, that physical characteristics will give a certain quality of the product. And that quality of the product should be attributable to the natural factors. Then here comes the other side. Uh, you have the the human dimension, wherein we call it is a, we call it as an intangible aspects. Um, if it's done by a certain community of producers for a long time, then they create history in a certain uh, uh, geography. Then, if they keep on repeating these uh, practices, let's say from farming, from um, processing of their uh, agricultural products to up to labeling then that becomes the culture or simply a tradition. If they keep on repeating, then, uh, then uh, the combination of uh, managing the natural aspects and, uh, and the human dimension, then, then you, have a, you have created a unique product specific to that region only. Um, GI is now uh, very popular in Europe because uh, it is a debate between um, because uh, they're winning the debate against um, uh, quality and quantity. So the, the very foundation of uh, geographical indication is to, to focus on the quality of the products. And uh, quantity can come later on, or we call it the economy of scale. Um, if, uh, 
if the wine producers in Europe are not protected against the 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 grapes or the wine wine producers around the world, then then uh, they can just uh, borrow the names without uh, without uh, referring to the geography and the uh, and the practices or the culture of that region. So so now. Um, um, the uniqueness of the product, or we call it the comparative advantage, is uh, being highlighted. And the benefits uh, that the product will give uh, should, should, be, should be given back to the community of producers. So, so this is how GI becomes so, so popular in Europe, because uh, it, it offers them, um, number one is uh, economic benefits, then number two is the environmental aspect, because you're dealing with the... Uh, with the natural environment, then three, you are you are protecting the culture. You are uh, maintaining the cultural culture and tradition of of a certain community. So this is basically the the easy presentation on uh, geographical indication. Um, in in terms of um, in terms of definition, um, geographical indication. In our Philippine definition, we refer this refers to indications which identify a good as originating in a territory, region, or locality where a given quality, reputation, or other characteristic of the good is essentially attributable to its geographical origin or human factors. Um, so we have we have a draft uh, rules and regulations on geographical indication, meaning we have a draft. Uh, legislation on GI, but uh, at present, it is still not uh, approved as a, as a separate law. Uh, it is still part of the Intellectual Property Code of the Philippines or the Republic Act uh, 8293. So this is our definition. Our definition, if you look at the, the concept of terwa, is basically following the same concept. Uh, you have the 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 tangible aspects, then you have the intangible aspects. And um, um, yeah, then also taking, taking off from the presentation of uh, Cablon Farms, uh, the, the, there will be questions like, uh, of course, uh, as shared by Cablon, um, based on based on the presentation, um, they have number one. They're they're doing organic farming, and uh, organic itself is a is a quality claim, and uh, this is already protected around the globe. So, if you export, especially, you cannot just claim that your product is organic without uh, having gone through the process of verification and certification. Then the other question is. Uh, um, as mentioned, uh, they have they have uh, uh, fermentation protocols. They have fermentation protocols, which are, I guess, is going to be registered or already registered as a process. Uh, this fermentation protocol or or uh, uh, fer fermented beans are giving unique flavors. And um, as mentioned already, they have a local definition of uh, different unique flavors. Now, the question is, uh, how, how can we transition? Or before that, um, if we are to, to upscale these uh, benefits to, from Cablon to, to South Cotabato, um, definitely there are emerging reputation for Cablon farms. But uh, at, the, at the South Cotabato level, um, is it clear that we already have identified the qualities or reputation or characteristics uh, that need uh, protection? Um, is the traditional trademark system enough to, to protect this quality or reputation? What if uh, some provinces in the Philippines will claim that their beans are also coming from South Cotabato? Can they also claim that their cacao comes from South Cotabato? Would the traditional trademark system uh, protect it? Or what are the other means of protection available? So definitely the, the direction to, to go, to transition to geographical indication is the most 
uh, logical step. So at the moment we don't have we don't have the law. We don't have uh, um, in our in our definition. Um, we have a definition, but uh, this is not really enjoying the same protection equivalent to the sui generis uh, concept. Um, I, I look at the help desk of the European Union. They warned their uh, businesses that in, in Philippines, um, the Philippines is compliant with the TRIPS agreement. Um, it includes geographical indications, but, uh, but the provisions of the IP code do not make further express reference to GIs. The IP code does not even define uh, geographical indications. Um, it only provides a registration system for collective marks. Collective marks is just the same as the following the IP code, uh, protecting the trademarks, but the uh, ownership of the trademark should be from a collective group. So it means uh, it cannot just be claimed by one, one business or one company to register as a trademark. It has to be shared by a certain community. Um, so what is collective mark? Um, so it, it's basically a mark or trademark assigned, designated as such in the application for registration and capable of distinguishing the origin or any other common characteristics, including the quality of goods or services of different enterprises, which use this, the sign under the control of the registered owner of the collective mark. So. Um, we have examples um, like um, we have examples in in the Philippines. We piloted we piloted the several sites, and uh, after after the project uh, supported by the European uh, Union, uh, we were able to register uh, three or four uh, collective marks. Uh, one is the one of, one of the first pilot is Tinalak in Lake Cebu, uh, Davao Pumelo, uh, Gimaras Mango, then uh, Bicol. So, so it may be a disappointment to the groups because they have undergone the process of developing the, their geographical indication, their products of geographical indication. But uh, they ended up, they ended up uh, registering under the collective mark system. Uh, simply because uh, we don't have the law to register or uh, protect uh, geographical indications. So, so the process uh, we've undergone uh, started with the consultation of the stakeholders. Then uh, we reviewed the, the collective organization. Either we, we, we work with existing organizations or we develop new organizations. Then... Um, the code of practice wherein the terroir was uh, technically documented, wherein all, all the natural factors and the intangible factors are being captured. Uh, this, was, uh, this was captured in a, in a document we call the code of practice. Then this code of practice has to be verified either by internal control or through certification. Then it has to be marketed. It has to translate to economic benefits. Then we added some activities like uh, helping groups in uh, developing their, their business plans on how to market their unique product and also using the, the label or the claims that this is unique only to the region. Um, so these are the, the, these are the, the pilots. In 2013 to 2014, then uh, in early this year, uh, the IPO Philippines released uh, a list of potential GIs. So in, in 2013, uh, personally, I was involved in, in, in most of the identified GI. Um, and uh, we were able to help uh, groups. Um, I think what's the main difference is... Um, in, in the pilots we did, like Gimaras Mango and Davao Pumelo, uh, these products are only until at the, at the fresh 
So the quality definition is only at the taste, uh, at the level of uh, fresh produce. Whereas in cacao, um, from the wet beans, you have to do uh, fer fermentation, then drying. Then from drying, you have to make this into chocolate. Then in the chocolate, the quality characteristics or uh, reputation should should be uh, experienced or should be uh, verifiable. Uh, so the main difference is uh, uh, in the pilots, we, we, we don't have pilots like uh, we were not involved. We, we, we started with Kalinga Coffee, but we were not able to finish it. Um, then also uh, Lake Cebu Tinalak, the example there is, uh, uh, it's, it's from Abaca and uh, involved are the, the, uh, the weavers, the, the Lake Cebu Tinalak uh, weavers. So the, the main difference is, uh, again, uh, the quality characteristics is uh, so different from, from, from cacao. But, but the process, but the process uh, we applied the same process on um, involving the different stakeholders. So primarily, uh, we, we consulted the, the producers themselves, including processors. In the case of uh, Dabo Pumelo, it started with, uh, with the big three players. And they said, uh, uh, for you to produce uh, quality pomelo, you have to have a bigger land. Like if you have less than two or three hectares, uh, it's not going to be viable and you cannot attain the, the quality. So we changed that. Um, we, we involved the small, the small uh, players and um, we made them understand that the ownership of the future collective mark or geographical indication mark should be owned by the, by the, by the community, the growers of, uh, the community of growers. Then in terms of ownership, who will own the label or the, the quality claim later on, then a formal organization has to be there. So, so we diagnosed the organization um, and uh, we ended up um, limiting the organization to the producers only. The suppliers of inputs, the traders of, the suppliers of inputs were not included in the organization. Uh, the traders of uh, Pomelo were not included, only the growers. Then, um, then the code of practice, uh, they developed this uh, fantastic uh, uh, scientific uh, way of uh, identifying uh, what defines Davao Pomelo. So number one, in terms of variety, it's not the yellow pomelo. And uh, the variety they, they claim is, uh, is called Davao Pomelo. Uh, it is a hybrid of uh, calamansi and pomelo. And um, it has a distinctive pinkish, reddish uh, um, uh, color. Then um, in terms of the natural factors, uh, they said uh, it grows well in volcanic soil. So they consider Mount Apo as their, as their, uh, their natural, their, uh, their tangible asset. Like if you cannot grow um, Cabo Pumelo in the base of Mount Apo or with the volcanic soil of Mount Apo, then you cannot uh, make a good uh, double pomelo taste. Um, these were captured in a code of practice and uh, this code of practice is being verified. So all the growers that are claiming to be having the quality of double pomelo are, are, uh, are following this uh, internal, internal quality assurance. Um, same with the uh, Gimaras Mango. Um, with Gimaras Mango from a provincial group, they were they shrunk to a small to a small uh, organization a basic organization because of the factors like climate change uh, the the growing season changed like uh, before they enjoyed uh, a straight five to six months uh, dry season now they're having rainfall every uh, during summer like uh, they they they're having rainfall uh, in less than three months or four months so so the flowering the the inflorescence of the mango trees are uh, are affected. So so production is uh, disrupted and uh, and uh, uh, growing growing uh, Gimaras mango is now is now very expensive for plantations. But nevertheless, uh, the group in Gimaras they said Gimaras mango is enjoying this uh, high reputation uh, in terms of international. Uh, reputation because uh, it is the only 
mango that's, that's accepted in the U.S. Uh, among the Philippine uh, exporters. So in, in that case, uh, uh, we, also, we also involved the different stakeholders, then uh, continued with the cooperative in, in Guimaras. Then um, they registered their uh, Guimaras mango as a trademark. So, so in, in other words, uh, um, we have geographical indication cases in the Philippines, but we don't have the, the legal infrastructure to register and protect the uh, different, um, the different uh, collective groups. Uh, so in, in going back to the, the South Cotabato cacao, if, if Cablon Farms is uh, enjoying these uh, economic uh, benefits, and would like to replicate and uh, reproduce this kind of uh, uh, production practices because uh, South Cotabato may have a good, a good uh, agroclimatic condition. Um, all it has to do is uh, try to do the same, uh, uh, check with the other stakeholders whether uh, they also like this approach, wherein the focus is on quality, especially on the unique flavors that can be that can be uh, derived from the cacao. Then next question is, uh, uh, would they be going to work in, a, in an organization like at the provincial level or, uh, or uh, at the regional level? Um, then of course, the code of practice, uh, uh, the claims that uh, the soil is good, giving this, uh, this quality for, for cacao in South Cotabato, this has to be uh, verified, uh, what's in the soil that gives these uh, attributes. Also, uh, what's important is the combination of uh, the natural and the, the intangible factors, like the fermentation protocol. Uh, should this be a common or, uh, or the techniques in, in sharing the fermentation uh, practices, the techniques in fermentation should be... Should be um, shared so that uh, other producers group in South Cotabato can also come up with their own uh, unique flavors based on the, the characteristics of their soil and, uh, and other factors. So, so these are the things uh, that to move forward, uh, I mean, at the heart, the heart of this uh, geographical indication is really on capturing the, the natural and uh, the intangible practices, the human factors, uh, the techniques, the Actually, the, the Cablon uh, fermentation is, is very innovative. Uh, you've seen the history. Uh, they've been already a, a traditional player in uh, fermentation, but uh, they were only able to develop a new innov innovative uh, fermentation protocol in, in 2018. And um, any, the verification of the reputation is there in the international market. So you have, you have different uh, chocolate makers around the world uh, enjoying this uh, Awards because uh, they're using the Cablon Farms uh, cacao. So, question to the South Cotabato stakeholders: uh, Would they allow uh, Cablon Farms to lead them in uh, developing these uh, uh, geographical indications, or uh, or would they work side by side? And uh, of course, uh, they can still compete at the same time cooperate. Then, uh, would they be able to? To continue this uh, this uh, good process that was uh, uh, initiated by Cablon Farms, then of course uh, the business model change will change because uh, Cablon Farms is a corporate uh, it's a corporate farm it's a family farm, but dealing with uh, at the provincial level, uh, what kind of uh, organization would it be? Then what would be the business of the organization? So, is it going to be um, only at the farming level uh, also, or is there a collective uh, sharing of uh, techniques at the post-harvest or at the fermentation? And uh, what kind of infrastructures that will be needed to, to maintain this uh, quality? So, so I guess uh, I can, I can um, stop from at this point and um, I'd like to go back to the to the host, Stella.
Right. Thank you very much for that, Patrick. And um, I'd like to say that, that that's the most um, uh, intensive kind of presentation I've seen that applies GI to a very specific product. And uh, I'd like to now invite our European guests, um, Peter, Matthew, and Isabel, to take over. John, if you could um, unmute and allow the video to start. Peter? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, good evening or good afternoon. Um, I was really impressed by the last speaker. Uh, some good questions about what's it all about, this GI, and um, uh, also good information about the consequences it will have. So. Thank you for that. Um, we are here in Europe and we are the consumer side of this whole story, which means, um, well, I'm a consumer, I'm a shopaholic, and um, I have the privilege to have a few bars here with me, and they are all from the Kablon Farms, made one series of bars made by Artist Chocolate in Germany and the other bars are made by Dormouse and they both use the same chocolate types all from one kind of chocolate. So there was a question about is it from the same beans? Yes, it's the same beans, but there are different fermentation protocols used. And that is for me as a, as a consumer, I'm completely thrilled about this idea of having different tastes from one being. Um, but uh, to go back to our GI question first, um, uh, a question to both you, uh, Isabel and Matthew. Um, why do you decide to use this? What's, what made you decide to use these uh, beans? Uh, is you, I'm, I'm going first, Isabel. Is that fine? Yeah. Um, so the reason, uh, one of the first reasons is, of course, we had these big gatherings of um, cocoa experts on festival in, in Holland. It was the very first time. But even before all that, we uh, asked for samples. And, of course, there's a massive amount of samples to choose from. So yeah. you don't want to be like any other chocolatier in the world. So you're looking for something special, something either you don't know or something which has uh, this geographical indication, something which is special, something which is small scale, which you can compare it to. And for me, that was one of the reasons or the main reason I chose for the Philippines and especially for Cablon Farms. And after making the first bars, we actually met Estella on uh, Shokoa, I think it was 2017 or 18, I, I, I forgot. Um, and she's like, you're using my beans. And, and then the, the story thickens, you know. Uh, then we actually started talking about yeah, what is special about the beans and why do they win awards. And uh, so, yeah, for us, it was mainly looking for something I could relate to as a European bean to bar maker where we know uh, geographical protection and indication. So something I could understand more easily than massive big farms which supply industry. So it's uh, uh, something to se separate me from other makers or uh, industry, basically. That was the first, first choice. Okay, and you, Isabel, why did you decide? So for us, it, it was all down to the seller. Um, we first met at, um, similar to Matthew, at um, a show in London, um, Alan Chocolat, where he came up to our booth with a suitcase bigger than she was, full of cocoa beans, and just like threw this bag of beans at me and said, You have to try these. And we did, and really loved the flavour. And that, again, that sort of connection um, through a cellar back to the farm, and knowing that it was a small a, a sort of family farm, and the flavour of the beans was incredible and so different to anything else that we were working with at the time. 
time. Um, so I think I came back from that show with a massive box, for example, just kind of thing that happens at shows like that. And out of all the samples, the Tablon were the ones that really stood out with my unique profile, like completely different from anything else in the working years. Um, and then, so we decided to start working with them and develop this really great relationship with Stella. Um, um, through that, being able to both sort of help with the fermentation experiments, sort of bringing in the beginning of the UK, running test batches, seeing how they actually work on a commercial setting, making sure that they, um, yeah, they work with our recipes and kind of being able to give that feedback from the chocolate maker perspective as well. Um, yeah, all of that just kind of combined and um, I've been so great and some great people behind them. Why you to work with them. Okay, and but n this is why you decide to work um, with this Cablon beans. Um, do you notice anything from the your customers? Do they ask for uh, for a, a geographical indication in any way? I mean, um, is it important for your customers to know? product do they buy? Do they want to know, is it Philippines? Do they want to know it's uh, from this region, this farm? Is that important for your customers? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, please, go, go ahead, Isabel. Go, go ahead. Okay. So, um, we work with beans from all around the world. So, Guatemala, um, Philippines, um, like Desco, Colombia, um, and people do come in specifically and say, like, what's new? What beans have you got? They're looking for specific flavor notes in their chocolate, so they know that we work with beans from all around the world, so they'll come in and say, I want something like mellow, in which case we definitely point them towards the Philippines, um, but the beans themselves have got that really lovely mellow biscuity flavor. Um, but yeah, people definitely want to know where the beans from what farm they've come from and why they have that a particular flavour based on where they where they've come from as well. Okay, experiences as well, Mathieu. Yeah, well, that, that's the thing because the story I said before, although being completely true, it was not for my own brand. So it was for a third cherry brand, which really was focusing on organic chocolate, which was really focusing on the health issues on the social level. So we really had to look exactly to the specifications of a certain chocolate bean to, to get there. And more than that, I mean, uh, Peter, you can see that in the samples you have in front of you. We work also with, uh, with uh, cocoa blossom sugar, so also something which is not indigenous to our region, so because it's unrefined, and so we really had to research a lot of beans, a lot of plantations, a lot of specifications, and the first thing, of course, after testing 40 types of beans, then we look at flavor, but... Uh, in making any type of chocolate bar, you have the choice in 4,000 types of beans from 400 different countries. So you have to follow it somewhere, you know. We can't all work with the same Madagascar beans from the same valley, from the same... It doesn't differentiate you as a customer. And my customers are looking exactly for that. It's, it's the differentiating factor. Okay. And labeling, would, would labeling make it easier for you? To tell the story, if you if there is a label on it saying this is for sure, it will help. Uh, especially if you look at labeling, for example, um, on my packaging, uh, my original packaging from my own brand, uh, we use gluten uh, labeling. We lose we use lactose free labeling. We use uh, these ones are specially made as a small batch with Estella, so I'm not 100 percent sure if they're on that one. But we use special logos so people can actually see straight away that it's gluten-free, lactose-free, it's uh, certified, it's, yeah, those, exactly. So people look at it and it's an indication of, you know. Um, and if I look in Europe to other products, for example, uh, Parmesan cheese or, or uh, stuff which have a protection on it, it's massively important because if I buy my cheese, I want to buy that cheese and not the other one. I want to make sure that I'm buying, you know, 
uh, the correct thing, which supports the community in the end. So yeah, it is. It helps massively, drastically. Okay. And Isabel, would you say the same or? Yeah, similar. We don't um, put any sort of logos like that on our bars, um, but we do have very specific front and center on the label. This is where the beans are from. And um, so having that geographical data would be another level to sort of say, yes, we know exactly where these beans are from. Here is the certification route to prove it. But my sort of main reservation is that by asking for these things, is it costing the farm money and is it adding value to the farm? So as long as that kind of concern is addressed and it's adding value um, at the origin, I don't, my sort of thing is that I don't see the point in having a pretty label if it's not adding value back where the beans have come from. Okay, okay. Well, for me as a consumer, I love it when I can nail, really pinpoint to one specific, uh, um, I would love to get to one tree, but okay, uh, that's a bit hard to do, but it's nice to have an address where a bar comes from. Uh, that's, that's for me really the, the, a thing. Um, yep, yeah, Estelle, please. Um, I just wanted to add something to what Isabel said about um, costs. And this is something that was really highlighted by the pandemic. And that in any certification um, that we do, that involves costs for us. And one of the things that we've struggled with um, during the pandemic is, can we afford it for 2021? And um, this is really a huge issue that should be addressed by the certification bodies because um, if the farmer cannot afford it, then can the producers afford it? Because we have to pass on costs to everybody in the sector, in the value chain. And um, I think this is something that really um, should be tackled as a community, which isn't being done yet. Um, and I just wanted to highlight that because the consumers also need to be aware about the complexities of certificate systems. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, now, uh, um, I have these bars and I was asked to do a tasting. So, here I am, this is your Fei Numon, forgive me how I pronounce it, but uh, I'm, I'm, that's my best Philippine I can do. Um, and it's the, the artist bar. And what I like about it, if you talk about fermentation, um, uh, uh, this is a four-turned uh, bar, and it has been fermented for four days as well. So that's, um, I mean, that's for a shockaholic like me. I pay an extra dollar just for that. <laughs> okay. Um, this smells like like heaven to me, I must say. It's a beautiful bar, Mathieu. It's It looks perfectly shiny. Let's, uh, oh, a snap like a razor. Beautifully. Uh, you, uh, Peter, not to uh, correct you, but the reason, for example, that chocolatiers also uh, make their own bars and their branding is in a way linked to GI because uh, you want to pinpoint where the beans are coming from. For me especially, I'm not as, uh, like you say, to the tree, but especially to the farm and for me to the family is a fantastic thing because it creates a community thing. But it's the same with our branding we do ourselves. We have our own uh, brand on the bar which guarantees you that it's not a bar that I bought from uh, I don't know who and put it in a different box, you know. So it's all linked to make giving the consumer um, the confidence of saying we put effort in this bar and uh, we all work together to create this product. So please enjoy it. That's basically what we're trying to say. I, I will enjoy it. But uh, uh, tell me, is the, is the social uh, thing, because Estelle talked about 
the price it it does cost some extra uh, a buy like this but is the is the social aspect of the the, um, the the people working the fair trade uh, thing is that important for you as well uh, yes the social aspect for sure you use the word that i'm not a big fan of meaning fair trade because that's also a label which is not uh, uh, 100%. Yeah, yeah we all know mm -hmm. But um, no, for, for sure. I mean, we work with different beans like Isabel does, like a lot of makers do. And for us, the social aspect is one of those things which does come into play massively. Because mm -hmm. if we can know exactly from what farm it is, what family, what communities are involved, uh, it gives us the, the idea or at least the feeling and the credibility of, of, of helping those people as well. Uh, compared to the bean that your industry buys, uh, prices at $2 a kilo, if you compare that to the prices we pay, um, yeah, it, there's there's just a massive difference, which is good. And don't get me wrong, I think the future should go towards that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you, Isabel? Oh yeah, I completely agree. Um, knowing exactly where the beans are coming from is such an important part of why we're doing what we're doing and being able to connect. For, for our customers as well, I mean, they come into my shop, they've got no idea how chocolate's made. They can see the beans, they can smell things grinding and roasting, and really connecting them back to where that cocoa has come from is a really important part of the story. Um, but yeah, again, like Matthew said, the um, maybe not necessarily the fair trade certification, but knowing that we're paying a much higher price for our beans um, is a really important part as well. Okay, okay. I'm going to taste your bar now. From this, this it's it's a beautiful thing to be able to do to taste two makers using the same beans with the same. But you you use cane sugar, Isabel. We use um, a light muscovado sugar. Muscovado sugar. Um, yeah. So yeah, it gives a little like, hint of caramelly base notes to the um the cocoa, and I've just seen the Stella's. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Oh, oh, that's beautiful. I, I have to drink something in between, otherwise I don't. You have the worst job in the world, uh, Peter. I Thank have the worst me. job in the world. This is what I'm, and I'm doing this every day. It's terrible. Oh. It's terrible. <laughs> now, for, for our Filipino for audience, please watch carefully and take your tips from Peter's technique. Mm. I, yeah. I am no technique. I just smell, I listen, I watch, uh, and the chocolate melts for, for itself. I don't have to do anything. Mm. Mm. And the, in, the, the interesting thing is there is a difference between you two makers and still you can taste the same, the same um, bean behind it. There is this this brown brown um, taste to it, if, if some bitterness in it, not too much. It's really a creamy. You b both made a really creamy uh, 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 chocolate, beautifully done. Not a lot of spice in this one, I must say. There's no spicy spiciness, which I which, I find, which I find strange because it's a it's a farm where they do grow uh, uh, spices, as I understand. Uh, the Cablon farm does produce uh, uh, chilies and things like that, but there's, it's not in the in the this bar. So that's that's interesting too. I think the, 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 the back end flavor of it, because I think that's a little bit because Isabel and myself, even though we don't know each other physically, um, we have a little bit of the same vision, I think. That's really making sure that the beans stand out and that you can really taste the difference in that specific process or bean or origin or, you know, um, the main difference between us might be machinery or stuff like that and the fact that we use different sugars but the idea behind it is the respect for the cocoa bean so in that sense i'm really happy with that comment that you say like oh i can 
taste it from the same bean, but there is a difference. And that's, for me, that's, that's a massive compliment to both Isabel and myself. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's beautifully made, but I'm now really curious about another protocol. Because it's, that's the, the interesting thing that the, the Cabin Farm made is these different uh, fermentation types. As you all know, uh, the fermentation is a big part in, uh, in the, the taste development. So uh, there is this geographical thing. It's from this region. It's from this farm. But there's also this fermentation that um, ha makes this chocolate a special one. I have now the, the Mala na Boulon. I, I hope I pronounce it in any acceptable way. And, and this one is a six days fermentation, which is a really long fermentation and three turns. So that's, that's something completely different. Let's see. The fun thing for us as well is when we receive the beans, at least in my point of view, I really try to make an effort and look at the different beans, look at how they are different uh, just by fermentation protocols. And you can already see a difference within those beans. I mean, uh, color wise, uh, how they look, how they, yeah, it's, 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 it's quite special, especially if you begin the process of roasting and breaking the beans, you already mm -hmm. have this smell in your room, which is different. And you know, it's going to be different. You just, to what extent? That's always the, the interesting part. Uh, how is how was working with these beans? Is this is this? Uh, um, I, I, sometimes makers tell me uh, a bean is a is, is a disaster because it doesn't do what they hope or something like this. Uh, how is this, the the the, the farms working with beans from them? Uh, not a disaster at all. Uh, <laughs> Uh, though I do understand what you're talking about. We did have beans that, and it's not only the beans, it's the way it's processed on the plantation, on the farm, uh, makes a big difference. So these beans for me were super clean. Uh, they all had a similar moisture level, which I always measure just to make sure my roasting profile is adapted to them. So uh, one of them is breaking a bit easier than the other one. That's just because of size and because of fermentation, I'm guessing. But uh, in the end, yeah, there, there, I didn't encounter any issues that I had to say that uh, something was blocking or something was... I No, I don't have that with these beans. If not, I would communicate that with Estella and I would that would actually, for me, be a point where I say if it's too bad, too much stones or sticks or stuff like that, that would be a point where I would say, ooh, will I work with these beans? Okay. And you, Isabel? Um, yeah, the same. They're, they're really lovely to, to work with. Um, and when we got the bags of the different fermentation protocols, even just opening the bags, you could tell there was something different. Um, with each one, just this lovely smell coming out of each bag as they were opened up. So because of the nature of the protocols and the sort of fermentation experiments, we decided to do everything that we could to control our processes. So all the roasts were the different protocols were the same, all the recipes, the grind time, the machine that we used. Um, so we wanted to sort of control every aspect that we could so that we knew the differences in the flavor were just down to the bean. Um, okay. So you, you, you used the, exactly the same roasting profiles on all the types? Yes. You too, Mathieu? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We really, uh, as I said, we measured everything from moisture to then how much is left over to make sure we use the exact amount of beans to the exact amount of sugar to the time it goes into the conch to the time it, uh, yeah, yeah, everything. As a maker, you really want to, uh, I'm going to say in a, in a way, know what you're working with. Huh? So you really need to uh, take yourself out of the picture and really let the process be as much the same as possible to then that's the only way you can really define are these beans great quality or are they lesser quality or are they exceptional and that's a bit of the yeah yeah Estelle please I just want to say that um, this is this is very interesting because the audience sees the supply chain so we have the farmer we have the chocolate maker 
and we have the logistics and we have the consumer. And um, I want to say that that the relationship with the chocolate makers are really important and that, in fact, I'm very scared of these two <laughs> chocolate makers <laughs> because if they say to me, okay, um, there's a problem with this, the flavor, but there's a problem with mold, there's a flavor of contamination. That is very important for us to know. But because they have that skill that we don't have at the farm level, then we are not able to um, implement anything if there's a problem without them. And this is the importance of that relationship that has to be established. Yeah. Um, it has to be two-way and it has to be uh, circular. Absolutely. And I understand you're afraid of them because, well, on, only one calls himself artist, but they, are, they all are. Makers like these are, are really artists. They, they do something unique not everybody can do. So, uh, here I go. Mala na bulong. Uh, Peter, uh, the artist is not me. Eh? The artist is the entire supply chain. Uh, so, the artist is from literally to the you, you, you use that name, so... <laughs> it's a good name. But all, all makers, all craft chocolate makers like you, people who work we have the finest of the finest are artists. Otherwise, you, you shouldn't start doing this. Oh, this one is much more woody, I think. Mm. Here we go again. Mm. Mm. One of the first flavor notes that come over, uh, Peter. Really mild, round, round. Um, some some acidity in it. Some some freshness, and here is some spice as well. Funny enough, I would say uh, oregano, something like that. But it 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 has some something with. Bitter. Something more bitter than the, the last one. Something more bitter than the other one. But it's not bitter like um, you have in bars like... Um, it's, it's around bitterness, but it's, it's still there. It's, it's present. It, has a, it gives a body, a, a volume to it. It's a more massive um, uh, chocolate. It's, okay. it's, a, yeah. it's also really chocolatey. I must say, it's really a chocolate uh, taste. It has some, some earth and, and profound chocolate uh, taste in it. The more grown-up chocolate than the... the more grown-up chocolate, yes, absolutely. I would say uh, this, this, is, uh, this is a chocolate for people who uh, um, seriously want to taste a chocolate bar. Not just um, something sweet and nice. Now I go for your bar, Isabel. I'm sorry, you uh, don't you have these? Uh, you, you don't have them. <laughs> That's really bad. Um, no, I, I have the artist ones, but I don't have the have the dormouse ones. Please do taste them. Do, do, do tell me what you 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 haven't had them as well. Oh, now your your bar has more, more um, what I call high acidity in it. The smell, at least, is something more uh, up in, my, in the front of my nose. No, let's see. This is a bad job, it really is. Mmm. Mmm. I found this meal more, more fresh. Strange that you can make a difference between the same, in, in, within the same bean. There are these differences. That's beautifully done. I think partially making it for freshness 
because uh, I hear that a lot. Um, with the sugars that we work with, it also makes a massive difference. Uh, working with a cane sugar, working with vanilla, working with, in my case, coca blossom sugar, it sometimes accentuates certain flavors, and mm -hmm. in other beans, it takes away certain flavors. And one of the flavors that is, is, let's say, more suppressed with coca blossom sugar from experience uh, is uh, this, this freshness and this acidity. So, yeah. It, com it comes more out in, in, uh, in the Dormouse uh, uh, bar. That yeah. it's, it's, that could be, but also oh, this is really wow! This is a, a thick layer of chocolate. No, uh, there's no um, no um, astringency in it, so there's nothing uh, you, you would uh, have. Um, uh, you don't get a dry mouth out of this. This is a beautiful made bar, really um, nice, but. Uh, it it has this um, in in the aftertaste at least uh, a real chocolate base beautifully. Yeah. So uh, tell me, Estelle. Um, I just want to make a general comment, yeah. which I have found with um, Isabel's uh, technique, and mm -hmm. that is that um, some of the bars, I think, especially the uh, seventy percent uh, regular harvest. Is actually, it feels like it's a high roast, but mm -hmm. despite that, you don't get any bitter flavors from over roasting. And I think that's a very important skill because the roast, the high roast brings out a different set of flavors um, while preserving acidity. And I think that's very, very special. I don't find that in a lot of bars. When, when they start getting too dark, it also becomes bitter. And that's yeah. not what happens with, with Isabel. That, that's a really um, good observation. The Tablon Farm bars that we make are actually the highest growths of all the beans that we use. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. So we, we tend to go for quite a light roast on most of our bars. Um, but yeah, the, the Tablon, they can just take that few minutes more, um, that higher temperature. Um, so yeah, they are the highest growths that we do. And why did you decide to, to do that? Why not? Um, it, it was just trial and error. Um, we tried the beans at various different roasts, and I thought that the flavor, the, the flavor that we sort of are aiming for with our pavlon is a really lovely oaty, biscuity flavor from the regular harvest. And I think that with the higher roast, it just comes through that a little bit more. Um, but was, yeah, like as I said, kind of, you want to take it to the edge of the roast and not tip it over. Um, it's quite easy to sort of tip it over into that sort of over-roasted, slightly rubbery, bitter flavor. Mm -hmm. but yeah. yeah. It's very interesting for me to hear that confirmation for the first time because <laughs> we've never discussed roasting, flavor, um, roasting notes. And uh, this, is, this goes to show, you know, practice, 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 tasting will get you... Um, will perfect your skills. This is something that doesn't happen overnight. No, 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 no. This, yeah. this, I, I, I'm, I'm really impressed because both of you don't over roast at all. What I have tasted now, it's really, it's, it's round. It's well done, but it's not over. And wow. that's that's um, uh, a lot of makers try to push it and give it uh, some. Uh, extra power, but the extra power is mo mostly killing the other things. So, exactly. uh, exactly. especially for us, I mean, going on roasting, we do uh, let's say a, a, quite a low to maximum medium ro roast on all of our bars. Again, because we're working with uh, with the, with the sugar, which gives us a load of flavor to it. So we have to watch out that if we do a high roast, it can actually be the sugar that pushes it over the edge to give it this. This astringent flavor to give it this this type of so again it's it's in the making there's there's so much that can go good and wrong but that's exactly the same that what happens on the plantation I'm sure Ernesto will be uh, will agree with me um, you you turn it a day too late or a day too early you have a different flavor set developing in your beans and for us it's it's the the same, though most of the, of, let's say, the important work has been done already on the plantation. <laughs> so it's, uh, but 
I mean, um, yeah, it's interesting for sure. Is it for for you? Um, I would like kind of to to round it up because we we are running out of time. Um, is it for you both interesting to have uh, to to have this assurance that um, uh, Cablon Farms does provide you with this quality every time? Yes. Or do you still do you still um, test for yourself? Do you? Um, I mean, you have to develop a kind of trust yeah. with your suppliers. I think. For sure. So what it actually is is there's uh, like I say, you need a certain base quality that you need to be able to rely on, because the testing, what Estella said before, it it takes a long time. For one brand uh, that I launched, a different brand, um, we took a year and a half, eighteen months of testing. Until we finally decided on what four or five beans we were going to use. So imagine if you want to launch a new product and you have to do all of that again. On top of that, the packaging, on top of that. So you need the certain trust that, yes, these beans are quality, they're, they are nicely done. Will it work with your process and everything? That's something we need to decide for ourselves. We, we can play with that. But if the base quality is not there, if that assurance is not there, then that relationship is not there, the quality is not there, then we can't work together. And as sometimes it's, it's unfortunate. But in this case, I mean, everything worked out perfectly with the right people, the good quality, uh, the good communication. So in that sense, what we have to do is only, let's say, 40% of the work because that base quality and communication is really good towards us as makers. So yes, that's, that's, that's super important. Okay. And the um, consistency as well from harvest to harvest. We know that every year when we get the new harvest through, it's still going to have that base quality as well, which is just as important. Um, the consistency is really important as well. There's no point getting a really great harvest one year and then the next year something's gone wrong at the farm level, the quality isn't there, we buy it anyway and then we discover we can't use it. So. Yeah, the, the consistency is very important too. So if if the, a thing like a GI would uh, happen, uh, this would be an important part. You have to have this um, uh, consistency in quality and the assurance that everybody who works with that does maintain this. Exactly. Otherwise, it, it wouldn't be of any value. No, well, the, the thing what Isabel just uh, uh, says as well, it's, it's what happens, and I completely understand, because we do visit plantations, and what happens on plantations, uh, something goes wrong. And all of a sudden, they don't have the production, so they buy in beans from certain locations, which are not from, from, from there, and they just mix them into the bags, and then you get a certain quality, which is, this is different, and as a maker, you try to somewhere stabilize that production, but you can't because it just it's different beans, and people have lied to you. Um, though we understand what happens on plantations, uh, you want this assurance that people understand our needs and values and the consumers in the end. I think that is is just it's it's primordial to building that relationship of trust for future uh, endeavors. So not only buying a couple of bags. But then being able, when we grow as the makers, to grow together with the farms, and I think that's at least for us a super important, uh, super important aspect. Okay. Shall we wrap up? We we wrap wrap it up. I have a few bars to go still, uh, but I will enjoy myself. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much to everyone. Um, and we will move on to the question and answer portion. We have less than 30 minutes to do it. But um, since we have the opportunity, could we ask Isabel, since we are at her shop, if she could have like a quick whiz through it? Is this still possible? Yeah. Um, and, okay. um, so everybody else can see, especially in the Philippines, what a chocolate um, kitchen is like um, over here in UK. So this, John, could you maximize that? Sorry. So this is our range of 
bars. So we have a very small um, setup and shop um, here in Manchester, but we, as well as selling our own chocolate, we've got other people's. Um, so we have a range of other UK makers and brew. And then, if you can, sorry, the light isn't very good in here today. Um, but you can really see behind where the shop is, the grinders, and then we have the beans and roasting. Um, so literally, when people come in, they can see everything in real time. Yeah, that's a very, very small condensed around what we do. Thank you for that. That's a, it's a small shop and I've been there, but um, I just want people to know in the Philippines that even at this level, you can become a very good chocolate maker. And Isabel is one of the most respected makers here in UK. So um, this is what craft chocolate is about, you know. Um, so we have seven questions here. I'm not sure if we'll be able to answer all of that. Patrick, could I also ask you to um, join us? Uh, so we can see you. Let's have a look at the first question here. Um, the three different flavor profiles you have are all from one tree. Like the flavors were developed by the fermentation process. Okay, I'll, I'll answer that in behalf of my uncle. Um, so, yes, there are three different flavor profiles. And um, the relationship between the flavor is... Uh, between the genetics and the re recipe for fermentation. So um, this is something that the fermentation scientists can explain a bit better, but basically uh, it is depend, the flavor prof, the, the chocolate flavors uh, are dependent on the kind of fermentation technique that they apply at the farm, but ultimately they come from all the same trees. Uh, there's a little bit of variation between sectors in the combination of, of um, trees that go into each box, uh, fermentation box, but ultimately it's the recipe for fermentation that will determine the flavor. Uh, question number two, how does geog geographic indications compare with cultural mapping? Um, cultural mapping as a heritage advocate, I will say, is only one part of the bigger process of um, uh, geographic indications. Uh, and I think Patrick will be able to add to that after this, but from my understanding is that we will have to initiate other steps and that includes um, scientific verification of, uh, uh, for example, genetic mapping of the trees and organoleptic tasting, which is not part of cultural mapping. Uh, do you want to add anything to that, Patrick? Um. No, I'm not familiar with cultural mapping, but uh, <laughs> the yeah, you're right. Uh, geographical indication is uh, more extensive because uh, yeah, you you look at the geography, the agroclimatic conditions, then um, the the cultural side is just one of it. So, mm. but very important also. Okay. So, question number four: How are the farmers compensated? Are they paid more than what the cacao beans are worth? Or is the equilibrium of prices for cacao increased? So um, there are two ways of answering this. Uh, and I think Tito June, uh, my uncle can agree or disagree or add to it afterwards. Um, first of all, uh, how are the farmers compensated? Well, because we're talking about one farm. Uh, we're just talking about the kind of prices that the cacao beans for Kablan Farms will attract. And uh, there's a market improvement pre-export and post-export after we've improved a lot of things at the farm. Now, the question of uh, are they paid more than what the cacao beans are worth or the equilibrium of prices for cacao increased? And yes, uh, the value of the cacao at the domestic market also increases. Is that right, Tito June? Yes, the value of uh, the value of cacao in the local market uh, increases uh, because uh, it has to compete also with the with the export market we're 
we're getting. No? Uh, as, as for now, we are buying uh, wet beans from, from farmers for our local processing because we already have reserved all the produce of Cablon to the ex export market because of the price difference. However, I would like to add that the, the local market is also becoming quite sophisticated and we're looking at the idea of um, creating something called the Tupi blend, yeah. which is coexistent in its own right, will have its own kind of um, marketing uh, chain. And this is just to distinguish now what is um, Kablan Farms organic certified and the conventionally um, grown beans that uh, is coming from the community, but will have the same kind of quality and um, traceability and transparency that comes from the skills of Kablan Farms. Right, okay, so there's um, question number five. Are investors in this field secured? Right, well, um, Kablan Farms itself is a privately owned corporation. It's um, a family owned corporation. But if we look at the bigger picture, if we look at GI, um, for South Cotabato, this is this is a blank right now, and what we're trying to do is um, propagate the idea of its feasibility on a wider base in the region, in the community, and at the national level. And so, in that sense, funding is not secure. <laughs> we are hoping to find our partners out there who will help the community and the local farmers to move up with us. Um, so if somebody was watching this and you are excited by this idea, please write to us and contact us and see how you can get involved. Uh, but yes, I, I think that we also need the bigger community at the international level to help us because um, this is a European project and it is the European Union that ultimately will support it. Okay, so there are... Um, I forgot to mention, we have guests from France, Egypt, and other parts of um, continental Europe, and I'd like to acknowledge them uh, because um, I'm sure that they're watching right now and they might have a question as well. Um, there is another question here, quite a long one, about uh, hybrid cacao. This is coming from a Filipino farmer. We are farmers from the foot of Mount Banahaw in Quezon province, and we recently started growing hybrid cacao. Um, we are very interested in uh, this idea to ask the European Union to guide us on how we can bring our beans uh, to the market and become as special as Cablon Farms. How do we get involved? Well, first of all, we have to get the project off um, and uh, actually create the geographic indications project. Uh, but ultimately, I think that involvement for farmers outside of South Cotabato will depend on whether there is a volume. Um, is that correct, Patrick? Yeah. There will be other parameters that have to be um, fulfilled. Yeah, De definitely the, the economy of scale uh, yeah. should be there. Um, they can start with small while, while uh, developing their quality. Then once the market affirms the, the quality or they, the market is willing to pay for the premium, then, they can, then that's the time they can expand. That's the time uh, they can increase their production or uh, perpetuate this to other uh, producers as well. Yeah. So we have the last question here. And I think this is directed to our European community who are the experts. What are we looking for when we snap the chocolate bar? Is there a particular sound that we are looking for? And how do they differ from bulk chocolate um, if there is any in terms of the snap? Oh, um, I'll snap. Uh, on that. Uh, it's something, um, yeah. 
most people know me as kind of a technical chocolatier or chocolate maker for sure. Um, and that's and snap has everything to do with the the way you make your chocolate and to make sure you release the right amount of cocoa butter from your beans. That's one step, you know. And I think most premium chocolate makers or bean to bar makers are adequately are good enough in that. So what you want is you want a clear snap. Don't want your chocolate being like bendy or whatever, especially if it's cold. You know, you don't want it to. Where do you do have that, and why is it so important? And I'm looking at the American market more than the European in that sense. Is that certain oils, products, um, soft margarines or butters are added to chocolate, which have a lower melting point, and therefore create this really soft uh, type of snap. I would say if you could compare it to, let's say, a standard milk uh, chocolate bar and a dark chocolate bar, you can just hear the soft snap of a, a milk chocolate bar compared to the harder snap of a dark chocolate bar. Keeping those two in mind, that's a bit what you're looking for uh, for any specific type of chocolate. So especially for origin chocolate, you really want this nice hard snap, making sure that, that it's tempered correctly that there's no other fats in there, that you have a, a beautiful looking bar, it's also important. And that assures you that the bar is nicely made. Before you taste or smell it, that already gives you an idea of like, you know, these people care about what they're doing. And that's like a massive difference with, let's say, supermarket brands, if you want me to just name them under one uh, umbrella. Uh, so yeah, for me, that's the importance of snap is everything to do with melting trajectory to texture to visual. So yeah, important one. And um, that just goes, uh, that's a very good demonstration to show you why I'm very scared of the chocolate makers. They really know what they're doing. <laughs> oh, I'm out of Stella, no worries about that. <laughs> Does anybody want to add anything to that? Because after this, we will take, uh, let John take over and we will say, wrap up and say goodbye. Yeah? John? Hi, so thank you so much for that wonderful discussion. We really enjoyed it. And for our viewers, so thank you for coming today. And uh, just to promote our social media channels, the Intermoral Administration is available on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And if you missed this episode or you came in late, do not worry feel free to go to YouTube later because we're going to upload this episode in our YouTube channel. So go to our channel, Intramuros Administration, or go to this link, bit.ly slash IAILS. Also, I'd like to promote our channel of the Google Arts and Culture. If you uh, want to view our museum collection, they are now available online. They have been digitized. So if you miss going to our museums, feel free to visit our Google Arts and Culture. Now, uh, do you have any Facebook page which you would like to promote, perhaps? Uh, perhaps uh, the blogger, uh, the, the Instagram. Maybe we can promote. What's the name of the Instagram? Peter Chocolade. Peter oh, Chocolade. Peter Chocolade, yes. Yeah. My, blog, my blog is in Dutch, so don't promote it. <laughs> oh, but there's a translation uh, function in Google. Because I read your, I read your um, website in English. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, is there would you like to say some final words before we end? Yes, so I'd like to thank everybody here um, right now in, who, is, who have been involved in this. This has been um, months in planning uh, and building up to the topic for cacao, which is um, one of our uh, advocacies in the Philippines. And also I would like to thank Intramuros administration for supporting us uh, and ECOMOS as well, which is one of the um, uh, advocacies as well that I have in the Philippines. And um, we look forward to uh, more projects in the future with the entire supply chain. All right. So, so thank you so much for that. Thank you, dear speakers, and thank you to all our viewers. Uh, we enjoyed 
this lively, very lively discussion today. So we look uh, uh, for our viewers, stay tuned to our next topic. Our next topic will be on November 7. So it will be about the fortifications of Manila by Eric Pedono, who is a research associate at the Ateneo de Manila University. So stay tuned for our poster, which we will publish this week. Anyway, for now, so maybe we should end this. So thank you again. And we are really pleased to have you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, guys. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you very much. Good night to everyone in the Philippines. Yeah, good night. Thank you. Thank you.